the test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear a conversation between Harry and Andrea, two students who have just finished their final exams. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi Andrea, how are you feeling now that exams are over? It's fantastic to have finished, isn't it? And to sleep in every morning. What about you? Well, I've been catching up on sleep too, but I've got a lot to do before I leave for England. Perhaps you could give me some advice. I've got a lot of things I can't possibly take back with me, but I don't know what to do with them. Well, it depends on what sort of things they are and whether you're thinking of giving them away or selling them. Well, almost everything. Furniture, the fridge and other kitchen stuff that I bought from the previous tenant. But the new people have already got what they need, so they're not interested in buying stuff from me. I can't afford to give it away, but I'm not sure how to sell it all. Oh, and there are some clothes and books as well. Why can't you take them? The books are really heavy. It's so expensive if you exceed the airline baggage allowance. And the clothes just won't all fit in my suitcase. It's amazing how much stuff I've accumulated since I've been here. Anyway. I don't think I'll need as many summer clothes in England as I have here in Australia. I see. Well, there are several alternatives. First of all, you could put up notices around the university about the books. You know, on the notice boards in the Student Union Building and in the Economics Department. Anywhere second and third year students will see them. People are always keen to buy cheap textbooks. OK. What, what should I say on the notices? Just put the titles, authors and price you want, your name of course, and maybe put your phone number on those little tear-off tags. That's a good idea. And what about the furniture? You could try doing the same thing, but usually students are away all summer, so they don't want to buy furniture now. Another place to try might be a second-hand shop. Someone from the shop will usually come around and give you a free quote, and then you can decide. But you don't usually get much money for that sort of stuff. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Another alternative is to put an advertisement in the trading post. Do you know that paper? It comes out every week advertising things people want to sell. You have to pay to put the advert in and then hope people phone. Give them as much information as possible and if they're interested, invite them to come and have a look. The hard part is agreeing on a price. No, I haven't seen the trading post. But I should have a look at it, and I could advertise the fridge, the microwave, and the furniture. But the kitchen stuff isn't really that good. You know, old cutlery, a few pots and pans, and some plates and things. What shall I do with them? Well, another option is to donate the kitchen things to a charity shop. You know, like the Salvation Army or St Vincent de Paul. Why don't you get a second-hand shop to give you a quote first? Yes, I could do that. Find out how much they'll give me and then decide whether to sell them or give them away. But I've still got the clothes. A charity shop will take them too, as long as they're in good condition. And even though you don't get any money, at least you know that someone who really deserves some help 
has benefited. That's a good point. I'll advertise the expensive stuff, the furniture, and donate the clothes and kitchen stuff. Let's go and buy a trading post, and you can help me write the advert. Well, actually, I'm interested in buying the fridge and the microwave, depending on the price, of course. Okay, let's see how good you are at bargaining. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a committee member giving a talk to a nature club about coming events. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Hi everyone! It's good to see such a big turnout at our nature club session for June. Just before we start this evening's workshop, I'd like to draw your attention to what we have in store for you in the second half of the year. First of all, the guided bushwalk. This is always a favourite. Starting out on the Springvale Plateau and continuing down into a section of the State Conservation Area. Last year, we invited children aged eight and over if they came with a parent, but the track has been washed out in a few places since then, and it can be quite rough. So this year, we considered restricting it to adults only. However, on reconsideration, the committee has now decided to recommend it for all bushwalkers who are over the age of twelve. Another very popular option is the bird observation walk. We'll be searching for both migratory and native birds as we walk through tidal marshlands and mangroves, and you can expect to get your feet uncomfortably wet and muddy if you don't wear rubber boots. These are a must. The leader will have a strong pair of binoculars, so we'll rely on her to name the species for us. And we've ordered some bird identification books that you may wish to purchase at a later date. From the bush to the swamp, and now to the sand dunes, our leader will help us identify plants native to the local area, as well as some invasive weed species. We'll be asking for volunteers to help pull out the weeds where possible, so a pair of sturdy gardening gloves is essential. Spades and other tools will be provided. It could get very hot, and you'll need water, plenty of it. But a local business owner is willing to provide bottled water free of charge. The next outing, Bush Tucker, is a new one. Have you ever wondered what life in this country would have been like two hundred to two thousand years ago? Well, come on this trip, and you'll find out how the indigenous inhabitants used local plants as food and medicine. Because lunch is included in this trip, there will be a small charge per person. We had originally thought seven dollars would cover the basics: sausages and bread, followed by tea and coffee. But then we thought a few different cuts of meat and salad would be nice, and that brought the price up to twelve dollars a head. At one stage, we even contemplated including seafood, but that would have been a bit too expensive. Around fifteen dollars, so meat and salad it is. We expect this to be a popular event, so we'll need advance bookings to organise the catering. Please let us know your intentions by the tenth of November, and be aware that we'll require prepayment by the fifteenth of November. You can still change your mind and get a refund up to the twenty-fifth of November, 
but after that date, if you pull out, you'll forfeit the money paid. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Well now, if you can give me a few more minutes of your time, I'll fill in a few details for you. The bushwalk led by Glen Ford is first up in July, on the second of the month. It'll start from Springvale as usual, but this year we'll be setting off in the morning at 9.15 and we'll get back at 1 in the afternoon. The bird watching expedition is on the 10th of September at Camford and the leader is the president of the Nature Club, our very own Joy Black. If you have any questions at all about bird life, Joy is the person to ask. This is a twilight outing from 4.30 to 6.30. Next up is the trip to the sand dunes on the 26th of November with Rex Rose. A bit of an early start, especially for those of you with a fair way to travel, but we'll meet at the Observation Hut at half past eight. That's the Observation Hut, 8.30 till 10.30. And even at that time of the morning, it'll be very hot, so come prepared. The last trip on the program is the Bush Tucker Excursion on the 3rd of December with Ranger Jim Kerr. This will be at Carson Hills and the presentation and demonstration will take place from 10am till 11.30 but be prepared to stay on for the barbecue and bush tucker lunch at 12 o'clock. I expect we'll wind up at 2 and you can head for home at that time. Well, that's all I have to tell you. A booklet will be mailed out to you later with those events, dates and times but don't wait, put them on your calendar now. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a lecture about dining services. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Welcome to the Dining Commons. This is the newest facility on campus, and I am proud to say, also one of the best. I know that all university students miss eating home-cooked food. Well, this year, we are hoping to provide students with food and services that will make you feel at home even without your family. The administration has been listening to the voice of the students. Students gave us frequent suggestions last year as to how we could improve the university. One of the most frequent suggestions was improving the dining options. We have been working hard all summer to come up with ideas that will make student life in the dormitories more pleasant. One of the new options we are offering in the dining facilities is variety in student meals. Last year, there was a set menu for every dinner, so if students didn't like the food, there was no choice. Students had to eat whatever was served. But this new dining facility 
has three completely unique areas, each with a different theme. At every meal, there will be three options for students to choose from. For example, there might be Italian food at station number one, which might consist of pizza and pasta. At station number two, there would be American food, consisting of hamburgers and hot dogs. At station number three, there could be vegetarian soups and salads, accommodating all the vegetarians. We hope that with the greater selection of food. All students will find something to their liking. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. Not only will students have more options, the food will also be better. Each section of the facility will have a head chef. These are real chefs that have been trained in culinary school and have been hired specifically by the school to work in the dining facilities. All of the chefs have a speciality. The school is hoping that these chefs will prepare better tasting and more nutritious food. Every student will be able to make suggestions, and also give their input as to which menus taste better. Last year, many students complained that the dining facilities didn't have very convenient hours. This year, we hope to change that. We will open for breakfast at 6 a.m. to accommodate all the early risers. In the evenings, we will open until midnight for all the students that like to go for a late-night snack. The afternoons will still remain closed, but we will have a student store open that will provide all students with drinks and fruit. The student store will be open every day. From 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Every student that has paid full tuition and dormitory fees has already paid for their dining facility fees. Students can eat at any time and in any amount for free. If you are a student that does not live in a dormitory, you can still purchase a dining facility card. This card will entitle you to the full services of the dining facility. This card is available only for students and is not open to the general public. If you are not a student and wish to dine here, you must purchase meals at the door. There are a few rules to follow. Even though we do not limit the amount of food that can be taken, we do not want students to waste food. Please do not take more than you can eat. Also. Every student must clean his or her own trays and plates. We will provide plates and trays for student use, but please do not abuse these items. Please do not leave your plates on the tables. Your parents are not here to clean up after you anymore, so I hope all students will be responsible. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the upcoming year. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. This is Jane Frost with this morning's edition of Wake Up with Frost. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good morning. This is Jane Frost with this morning's edition of Wake Up With Frost. As you all know, for the last week we've been running a survey trying to find out what you, the listeners, think is the greatest invention of the last 200 years. The response has been amazing, double the amount we had last year, so thanks to all of you for taking part. We've had about 2,000 responses online and about the same on our phone lines. The lines are now closed and this morning I can announce what the results were. So, here it is. You, the listeners, have chosen as the greatest technological invention of the past 200 years, and let me not forget to mention that 65% of you voted for this, it's the bicycle. Yes, the bicycle, first invented in 1818, and, would you believe it, the first bicycle was made of wood. The second bicycle had iron wheels. I cannot imagine what that must have been like to ride. It would have kept you fit at any rate. But for me, the best thing about the bicycle was what it did for women's rights. Yes, in the 1890s, it was the bicycle that meant women could change their clothing, start wearing trousers or pantaloons, as they were known. Before then, women's clothes had been really uncomfortable, and I'd imagine quite difficult to breathe in. So, thanks to the ordinary bicycle, it was not only the man who wore the trousers in a home. Instead, women could now feel far more equal to their male contemporaries. And, I'm sure you'll agree, the bicycle is a great way to get regular exercise, and, of course, it's much better for the environment. And today, over one billion people all over the world ride bicycles, and for some, it's their only means of getting around from A to B. So, to all you bicycle riders out there, keep up the good work. Coming in a close second with 42% is the computer. I found out something interesting about the computer, which is that really this word first meant someone who did mathematical calculations. Of course, today, with the development of the personal computer, computers are being used for everything from home use to business and even digital photography. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine life without a computer now. I guess closely related to the computer is the internet, and this got 12% of your votes. Maybe, like myself, many of you might think of the internet as being the World Wide Web, but actually the web is only one part of the internet. The internet began as part of the United States military network, but it later began to be used by businesses and academic institutions. Of course, today, the Internet has so many uses. We use it for shopping online and entertainment, as well as to find information and send emails. But sadly, there is a darker side to the Internet, and some of you have sent me emails about this. Finally, with 5% of your votes, is the radio. We think the radio was invented by Marconi in 1896 and he opened his first radio or wireless factory in the United Kingdom in 1898. In 1906, a man called Reginald Fessenden gave the first radio broadcast from Massachusetts. Ships could hear him at sea and apparently he played the violin. As yet, listeners... I've spared you from having to listen to my guitar playing. But certainly radio is still important. Let's not forget that it was by radio that the Titanic sent signals to other ships. And with the popularity of TV today, 
I was secretly pleased so many of you had still placed importance on the radio. So, there you have it, the results of our survey. I think there are still important inventions that were not chosen but deserve a mention. Nuclear power and, of course, communication satellite, something which I am certain will continue to change the face of how we communicate with each other over both long and short distances. In fact, for me, the mobile phone is one of the greatest inventions of the last 200 years, if I think back to my first phone and then I look at what is happening now. Children born today will probably be more likely to have their first experience of the internet on a mobile phone screen rather than a computer monitor. Some of the new mobiles that are now being sold make it just as easy and as quick to find information on the web as on a computer. And let's not forget that mobiles now have digital cameras, word processing facilities, so you can type all your documents and even personal organisers. I think it's quite possible that the mobile may even replace computers one day. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer sheet.